I, I'm sure our audience has many questions, but I'll, so I'll, but I have a few, so I'll just start out, off. Um, uh, the, your, your film does uh, many things at once. It's a it's a it's a love story. It's a science film. It's uh, an incredible portrait of of two two historical figures, scientists and and filmmakers in their own right. Um, so I'm I guess I just want to start off with maybe the obvious question is that how did Katya and Maurice uh, become subjects of your film? Um, that's a great question. Uh, technically, they, <clears throat> they became subjects of the film actually when we were making um, the, the film that I directed before this, uh, a film called The Seer and the Unseen that uh, my producer Shane Boris uh, also produced and, and editor Aaron Casper also edited that film. Uh, that's a verite film that was shot in Iceland. Um, however, we wanted the opening of, of the film to um, tell the story of how Iceland was created and as a volcanic island Iceland was created through volcanoes, and we thought that uh, archival material could actually help to tell that story well and kind of give it an out of time feel. So we started researching Volcano Archives Iceland, and we learned about Katya and Maurice through that. Um, and the more we learned about them as people, the more we fell in love. Uh, you know, um, yeah, we, we began to research, and, and specifically there is this line in one of Maurice's books where he says, for me, Katya and volcanoes, it is a love story. And once we, real, we read that, that was like, okay, uh, that's, that kind of provided such a um, kind of uh, initial inspiration for how, how to guide the film, how to tell the film as, as this love triangle, so to speak, between Katya and Maurice um, and volcanoes. So that, that's really kind of what kicked off the journey. Can uh, can you talk more about you know your research process um, and and how you eventually settled on uh, making a film that is nearly exclusively archival footage? I mean, we see it at the end of the credits. There, I mean, there are sources from all over. There are hundreds of sources, it seems. And uh, I'm also sure you know restoring and and reassembling uh, this footage was no easy task. So I'm just yeah, curious to hear more about that process. Yeah, so in terms of research, we, we were very much, um, we, we centered on Katya and Maurice first and foremost themselves. Um, you know, the fact that they so hungrily went towards volcanoes and captured them uh, both through their cameras as well as through their words, that, that's where we started. Uh, we watched their hundreds of hours of footage, saw their thousands of photographs, and, and you know, we're excited by the millions of questions that, that we say early on in the film, um, and that, that led us like into deeper inquiry for sure. Um, you know, they, read, they wrote nearly 20 books. Um, we read those, that there's uh, biographies of those, uh, of, of them that we, you know, of course read. Um, but we also contacted people who knew and loved them. Um, we never filmed the interviews because we knew early on we wanted the film to be composed of, of the materiality that they left behind rather than include like talking head interviews or anything that was shot now. Um, but those uh, interviews that we did provided such important context, uh, kind of gave us deeper dimensionality in, into who they were, um, and that, that really helped. Uh, but in terms of assembling everything, I mean, uh, my two editors um, are here. Um, one of them was here at first, the other one just arrived, so Aaron Casper and Jocelyn Chaput are, are really to be given extraordinary credit. Um, they went through all of the material um, as well. Um, and uh, we were baffled by it. I mean, it's such a spectacular archive um, uh, that we had. There, there were kind of two buckets. There, there was uh, the 16 millimeter archives that Maurice and Katya shot, and then there was about 50 hours or so of archival material that um, was uh, you know, filmed of Katya and Maurice from television programs and, and radio broadcasts, mostly in, in Western Europe. And th th that was like the main kind of, um, the two tranches that we were working from. Um, but uh, there were such limitations um, in their own material. You know, we, one reel, for example, would be say like five seconds of an extraordinary volcano shot two seconds of a gas vent, um, you know, you know uh, with beautiful ethereal gas um, pluming into the air, and then an iguana <laughs> for like five seconds, and Katya in an inner tube. Uh, then, you know, there was just all these things that didn't quite make sense to us, um, but trying to understand kind of the, the juxtapositions between these things um, that really helped us with this kind of associative style that, that we developed in, in the making of the film. Yeah, I mean, can you? I'm, I'm there. I mean, watching this film, I was so curious to sort of under, get an understanding of the, the relationship between the writing process and the editing process, which I'm sure was like you know very very interlinked. Um, 
So I'm just curious how you sort of found this balance between you know the written narration and uh, you know just knowing when to let the footage speak for itself. Yeah. Um, the writing process was, I think, the most challenging part of making the film. Um, it was deeply collaborative um, and also a joy, despite despite the challenge. Um, we, we knew very early on that we wanted a narrator for the film, uh, largely because the archives, um, they, they did have these limitations. Uh, the other thing, too, as, aside from kind of these interesting juxtapositions and questions that we had um, from the reels themselves, the 16 millimeter footage didn't have any sound. And so there was a, um, a lot of context that we couldn't access. And so we thought kind of narration um, could be a vehicle to tell the story and also provide a measure of interiority for, for Katya and Maurice. Um, but at first, kind of, we, we wrote things uh, on the expositional side. Um, it was very kind of plot driven um, to carry the story along, and we very quickly realized that wasn't going to work. Um, and that an, an inquisitive narrator who could express the same kind of curiosity that Maurice and Katya perhaps had for volcanoes would be um, particularly useful, kind of, to, to prompt the questions and, and seed the idea of, of mystery or, or going towards the unknown rather than claiming to possess like full knowledge. Um, you know, because Katya and Maurice could never possess full knowledge of the volcanoes that they so longed to understand. Um, but it was a constant dance that we did between the writing and the imagery. Um, we wanted the writing to get out of the way um, of, of the imagery, but to provide just enough to kind of put your attention to certain things, to, to ask certain questions, and to draw some relevant themes um, through the film. Um, we like had a hand motion, actually, that we did in the edit room a lot. We went like like that somehow um, it, was, it was kind of it was always like a dance it was uh, we, we were always kind of adjusting um, uh, you know uh, be between the imagery and the words um, yeah if, if that makes some kind of yeah. sense well and on the topic of narration can you talk about how you know Miranda July gave gave voice to this film yeah so at first we actually we thought we might want uh, a French narrator because you know of course they're based in France um, uh, but later on in the brainstorming process, um, our executive producer, Greg Baustad, he, he mentioned Miranda, and we were instantly like, yes, Miranda is perfect. Um, she's been an inspiring force um, for all of us on the team for a very long time in, in terms of her work. Um, so much of her work explores kind of the, the kind of precarity of human relationships, just um, how strange and, and beautiful it can be to be alive. Um, a lot of her work also deals with existentialism, and th that's something that we uh, were very um, excited to kind of play with in this film. And so aside from her um, you know, extraordinary talents as an actor, her body of work too, we just thought she would bring a tremendous kind of depth and, and richness um, to the film, and, and uh, getting to work with her was Amazing. Um, I should say though that that Jocelyn um, is one of our editors. She did the temp narration, and she did a phenomenal job doing that. And, and she really helped to kind of set the tone. And so Miranda had some big shoes to fill. <laughs> um, but getting to work with her, yeah, she really added kind of a feeling of vulnerability and, and curiosity in, in her performance. And it was such a dream to get to work with her. I mean, I, maybe to, to, to go back just a little bit, I, I am curious if at any point in your process, if, if it was maybe when you were researching, um, uh, editing, or even just, you know, uh, you know, toying with the, the, the tone and inflection of, of a, the narration, if there was anything that, you know, particularly surprised you in the process that might have changed the course of the film or, or just your perspective on, on your subjects? Oh, so many things. Um, I think the more we watched the footage, I think we were really struck by Katya and Maurice's own performance in their own footage. Uh, the older they got, the, the more they filmed, the more they actually do show up, and, and in very specific ways. Um, uh, I will never know if it's true, but a gut kind of always told me that they were inscribing themselves in their own myth uh, in a way. They, they were setting their own image to posterity because they knew any moment could be their last. And they were their best storytellers, um, uh, so to speak. Um, yeah, they were authoring their own story in, in this way. And, and that was so haunting and beautiful. And I think really did, for us, the, the more we kind of witnessed that and understood it, the more that kind of, um, 
became full, it, you know, was folded into the, into the film itself. Um, and that's where, you know, you have like the, the moments of where we talk about their own filmmaking and Maurice very humbly and jokingly saying that he's not a filmmaker when of course he's just like the most extraordinary cinematographer. Um, so that added a lot of depth to, to our process and for us was such a delightful curiosity to get to pursue. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty fascinating to see how well dressed they are in front of a volcano. <laughs> yeah, yeah they, they had their outfits down for yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, we, we could open it up to some audience questions, uh, if there are any. Hi. Um, thank you very much for the film. Um, I'm curious as to the, the, there was so little on the end. There was just the showing of their urns. And I'm curious as to what kind of response was there publicly beyond that and why did you choose not to show that if it's if you're talking if, if you're interested in the myth part of the myth is the adulation afterwards or the sadness or so I was curious as why you didn't show that and what was there yeah. oh that's a great question um I, I really love that there there wasn't all that much archival material specifically from their death there were um their death was widely reported on in, in the news um uh, it was a big deal, 43 people total passed away in that eruption. Um, the tenor of those reports, uh, it was uh, very different than kind of the tone that we wanted to set at the end of the film. Uh, um, it was, you know, news footage, it was very kind of factual reporting. Um, and we really kind of wanted Katya and Maurice to, to have the last word, so to speak. Um, uh, we wanted it to feel, uh, of course, bittersweet and, and respectful, but, but this is, in a way, what Katya and Maurice wanted. Um, they, they made peace with their own death early on in their life. They knew that if they were living life the way that they wanted to, they would die this way. Um, and so we really kind of wanted to bring that kind of towards the, the very end of the film, even though, of course, we planned it early on that they're going to die, and we kind of set their clock, so to speak, in, in that regard. Um, but... Uh, yeah, we also wanted to end on kind of a, a jubilant note because that is how they wanted to go, um, where it feels celebratory and, and you can kind of see some of the, the full circle kind of nature to how they lived their life and, and how they ultimately died. Um, but luckily they're, you know, they, they have this profound legacy and I do hope people will continue to talk about Maurice and Katya and, uh, for, you know, years to come and, and that this can be kind of one little... Um, yeah, well, one step in, in the greater myth that, that is Katya and Maurice, if that makes sense. Uh, could you speak a little bit about the uh, sound design? Like, you mentioned that a lot of the archival footage did not have sound, so I imagine there was a lot of Foley work for the volcano footage. Could you speak a little bit about that process? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, the 16 millimeter footage did not have sync sound, and um, Aaron and, and Jocelyn, our editors, went to great lengths to build uh, sound design into the, the edit from a very early stage. We thought at first um, that we could get away with having silent images and just have some text on screen that says, you know, car honk here, wind blows in here, but the, it just didn't, it didn't work. Uh, sound plays such a constitutive role in, in the narrative of any film, and also to just build out this, this um, explosive world that um, they started to go to great lengths. Um, the, the, if any editors or, or anyone who works um, you know, uh, with Avid or, or Final Cut is in the, or Premiere is in the room, um, you'll understand this, but they're, their timelines felt architectural. There was just so many layers of sound that they were bringing in, um, and they were so specifically researched. Um, you know, uh, they found like the, the specific type of car engine that Katya and Maurice um, used. Uh, they researched the particularities of volcanic eruptions around the world. Um, so, so there was a realism to, to the sound that they were working with, even though you know it didn't come with the actual footage. Um, but since there wasn't sound. Uh, it also kind of opened up a, a space for play. Um, we were very inspired kind of by um, magic realism in, in making this film, and uh, sound was a way that we could kind of em embrace that as aesthetic um, uh, mode. Uh, for example, in the scene in um, Indonesia in 1979, um, Aaron started experimenting with putting dinosaur sounds <laughs> into those eruptions to kind of bring out this like feeling of monstrosity in, into them. And you can't quite tell that it's, it's dinosaurs, but, but it does like kind of add, it, it expands um, kind of how you experience the volcanoes in that regard and brings that kind of sentience and, and foreboding quality. Um, so I'll just say there was tr a tremendous amount of work that went into it. 
we then had the pleasure of working with this post-production house in, in Montreal um, where, where we finished the film. And we had a sound designer named Patrice LeBlanc who worked with a Foley artist uh, and this fabulous re-recording mixer named Gavin Fernandez. And they just really kind of elevated the work that Jocelyn and, uh, Jocelyn and Aaron had done um, to make it multidimensional and, and to take it to the place that, that you saw here. But kind of getting to play uh, with sound um, for us it, it was a challenge, but such a joy, and, and we really hope it did kind of flesh out the character of volcanoes. Uh, well, speaking of sound uh, and, and how it gives the film this kind of magical quality, uh, as you said, um, can you uh, talk about how uh, Nicolas Godin uh, came to score the film? Maybe best known for being one half of Air. Yeah, so um, we, uh, we from uh, the beginning of the project, we wanted the score to feel playful, romantic, um, and also kind of retro-futuristic. Um, we wanted the film to, to somehow kind of like, yeah, feel like it, it was told in the past but gazing towards the future, if that makes sense. Um, and Air is a band that kind of always uh, had that um, aesthetic or, or vibe um, in our mind. Um, and so in the brainstorming process, Air came up and we're just like, yes, that'd be great. They're also a French band. Um, so we, we wanted to you know, bring in French music as much as possible. Um, and yeah, it, it was a blast getting to work with him in that regard. Um, there's a, a lot of other music that isn't Nico's in, in the film too. Um, uh, that we had a lot of fun playing with, um, but uh, yeah, getting to work with his score and, and um, he also, when, when he was little, he remembers the crafts and, and grew up with them. So he brought in a, a lot of love and, and a personal personal connection to to the music that that he made as well. Uh, yeah, we can take your question. Um, I particularly like the use of animation in the film, uh, particularly the style you used because while somewhat separate from the f archival footage, it itself is based on archival material. Um, so I was wondering if you could touch on that and um, the people who are responsible for it. Sure, yeah, so early on in the, in the process of making the film, we decided we wanted to use um, animation, again, because the, the archives themselves had limitations and we also thought animation could kind of communicate this dreamy feeling of falling in love. Um, but love for Katya and Maurice um, was rooted in volcanoes and specifically in research. Um, you know, we have that line in the film, and, uh, understanding is love's other name, for example. Um, they hungrily collected as many illustrations of volcanoes as possible. They just had thousands and thousands of, of these illustrations that were at once whimsical and scientific. Um, and I think dating back, I, I want to say towards the, the 14th century, so you know, years, generations, you know, centuries worth of, of these imagery. Um, and that really formed the, the inspiration for our style for the animation. Um, but we wanted it, as, as you said, um, we wanted it to feel archival itself. Um, and that's why we chose the paper cutout style. Um, we worked with a fabulous uh, animator named Lucy Munger, who I don't, I don't think Lucy's here tonight. She, she was here yesterday. Um, but she did just an, a phenomenal job kind of taking um, yeah, these illustrations and, and manipulating them the, the way that she did. So it was, it was really a lot of fun for us. Yes. Um, kind of touched on this a little bit when you mentioned uh, magical realism, but the film, when it's introduced, usually it's kind of introduced as a multi-hyphenate documentary, you know, science, biographical. Did you go into it uh, wanting to fit it within these genres, or did you have uh, the idea or intention of kind of bucking against convention? Um, that's, a, that's a great question. First and foremost, we wanted this to be a love story, and however that could be a love story, that that's what uh, we, we wanted it to be. But, but I really see this as a collage film, more than anything, um, of pulling these different threads together, these different pieces, whether it's the different archives or the narration or, or the animation together. Um, but it was always kind of the love story that, that guided it. Uh, and of course, there's different kind of layers of, of love stories. And, and within that, as you said, is, is the magically real. We, we wanted it this to kind of play in tropes of myth, um, I really see kind of science and myth uh, aligning kind of in, in how they both speak to the unknown. They both try to answer these questions that can 
never be answered, whether it's about kind of the, the nature of the planet or the human heart, so to speak. And so that was something that we really tried to play with and, and bring into the film, kind of all under like the grand heading of, of a love story. Yep. Hi. Uh, I was curious what working on this film has taught you about love. Uh, first, you're wearing a red hat, <laughs> which is awesome. <laughs> so, thank you. thank you for that. Um, I could I could say a lot of, about that, but I'll, I'll try and keep it short. I think um, Maurice and, and Katya really taught me what it means to live a meaningful life and to die a meaningful death. And I, I really think the heart of that is about love. They, they went towards what they loved with such passion, uh, with such dedication, um, in a quest to understand, all the while knowing that they could never fully understand. And that kind of duality um, has meant so much to me and, and all of us on our team. We spent so much uh, time talking about exactly that. Um, so I think, yeah, it's, it's that relationship between love and meaning and what it means to live a, a meaningful life when any moment could truly be your last. Um, I think I've also learned that love can be as baffling as a volcano, <laughs> as well as as like creative and enchanting as one too. Um, uh, but yeah, having recent Katya as guides for what it means to love, um, whether it's each other or the planet, um, it's really, it's been a profound gift and, and one that came at um, a dark time. Uh, we made this film, you know, in 2020 and 2021 when we were so isolated. So to get to explore kind of uh, the work of these two people that um, did so much uh, work to connect humans, to, con to connect ideas of, of, you know, the planet, um, it, it was uh, a, a true refuge for me and, and our whole team. Uh, yes, we can take your question. Right. Uh, so with this love story, um, did you happen to have any consultants that knew the couple, uh, Katya and Maurice, uh, or did you base this love story only from the, doc, you know, like from the footage and their diaries probably? Um, we did, yeah. We spoke to about 15 people who uh, knew Katya and Maurice um, very deeply, um, collaborators of theirs, cinematographers, um, as well as family members. Uh, one of my favorite days on, on the entire project was uh, a long day I spent with Maurice's brother, Bertrand, and his wife, Elizabeth. And it was amazing. He, he was so similar to Maurice. <laughs> um, he, he's a scientist himself. He studies the uh, social relationships of spiders. <laughs> and getting to hear him talk about spiders made me think of Maurice and volcanoes. It, it was incredible. But the stories that he shared and, and the, uh, the other people we interviewed as well um, really did add so much to how we approached the footage and, and told the story, especially the narration. Um, uh, you know, they, they wrote about 20 books themselves, and, and that really helped as well. There's a number of biographies about them, too, and other documentaries about them, um, even though most of them were in, in the 70s and 80s. Uh, but we really tried to, to be guided by them themselves. And we had our own interpretations, of course, which made its way in, in, into the narration. Um, but we wanted it to feel as true to them as possible. Thank you. Yeah, I was just wondering how did you like start the research? Did you have like a list of like questions you wanted to like ask them if they are there, or is it more like that you went with the flow and started reading without like having any pre like? Um, decided directions to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, yeah, we, we started the research uh, process very much just kind of wanting to know absolutely everything we could know about them themselves, uh, but particularly for, through the lens of the love story. A again, reading that um, sentence that Maurice wrote in one of his books very early on, uh, you know, for me, Katya and Volcanoes, it is a love story. That really kind of immediately narrowed our focus uh, to have uh, a film about Katya Marie's and volcanoes, because there's so many different directions we could have taken with this film and, and with their expansive archive. Um, 
But the more, kind of similar to them, <laughs> similar to the fact that the more they chased volcanoes, uh, the more they realized they didn't know, um, that we very much experienced that ourselves. The, the more we researched, uh, the more we pursued kind of these questions about the relationship and the relationship to volcanoes, um, the more we, we realized there, there's so much more to learn. Um, and that's where we started to track down people who knew them and, and loved them, it got even more kind of nuance and depth, but, uh, but I still have a, a million questions that will remain unanswered. Um, there's like an unrequitedness, quite honestly, to the research process because they're no longer here. Um, I feel like I've had conversations with, with them in my head so many times and I feel like I know them after watching so much of their footage and reading so much of, you know, so many of their words. But um, yeah, the, these questions will persist and, uh, and I guess, yeah, there's, there's something romantic <laughs> to an unrequited feeling, so, so maybe that's fitting for our film. Um, but yeah, I hope that answers your question. So I, I don't speak French, uh, my French, or rather, I, I can understand a lot of French, but I speak French very poorly. Um, but one of our producers speaks fluent French, uh, one of our editors, Jocelyn, speaks fluent French. French is her, her native language. Um, we had everything translated and subtitled, and so that, of course, made it uh, uh, much easier to work with. Um, uh, but of yeah, translation is, is, is such a meaningful part of, of any film. Um, so we, we did spend a lot of time on the specific word choice. Um, uh, you know, Nico, uh, Nico Godin, our, our composer, was also French, and our post-production team was all based in Montreal, so we really were trying to, to bring in the language as much as possible. Um, but it's very much ignited my curiosity. I, I hope to learn the language better. Uh, and getting to know their work really introduced me um, to French music in, in greater depth. Um, their, their work was very reminiscent, actually, or I shouldn't say reminiscent, but you can see flourishes of, of French New Wave, actually, in their own work. For example, in Reese's camera work, there's a lot of really fun and playful snap zooms. It was clear that they were influenced by the aesthetic movements of, of the time that they were coming of age. And so that was something, too, that we as a team really tried to embrace and explore and, and help, uh, yeah, that, that really helped to kind of guide some of our choices in, in the edit room when we were making the film. I'm afraid we have to wrap it up, but uh, Sarah, thank you so much for being here and sharing your film with us. Thank you, Tyler, and thank you all for being here. It's really been fun.